Οκ, okay, παίζουν πώς να ξεκινήσω. So welcome everybody to the today's uh, seminar. Uh, we have with us uh, Yorgos Lukas Gerakopoulos, uh, now in uh, Prague, Astronomical Institute uh, of the Czech Academy of Science, uh, and now member of uh, our research center, as everybody knows. Uh, that means we would not any, need any special introduction. You see the title already projected me on your screens, Celestial Mechanics and Extreme Mass Ratio in Spirals. And Georgos, you may start. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Panos. So you see this uh, title. So I will discuss uh, um, a binary system, which is consisted of two black holes or uh, a black hole and a neutron star. And this is why it's called extreme because one of them, which I will call usually primary, is a supermassive black hole. And then you have the secondary body, which is uh, the neutral star or a smaller, lighter black hole, not necessarily stellar. So you might have something like an intermediate uh, mass black hole, inspiring a very supermassive black hole. And again, this is an extreme mass ratio in spiral. And why I call it celestial mechanics, because we use basically things that are coming from uh, celestial me uh, mechanics. You will see a lot of perturbation theory involved in uh, the treatment of these systems. So, uh, and before I start, I would like also to uh, say that I'm sorry that I cannot be there in person because I had, uh, uh, had COVID. Uh, last uh, week, so, but we are now fine. So it was a little bit risky to come so soon and to give in person a talk. And, but I will visit next week probably. Uh, so let me go to the next slide, which is a little bit uh, describing what I will talk about, the introduction where I talk about the big concepts, gravitational waves, gravitational waves uh, uh, detect, uh, detectors, what are the methods in general that are used. And then I will go and I'll talk about the specific system, the extreme mass ratio in spiral, uh, some basic uh, methodologies, uh, concepts, treatments. And the third uh, part, I will talk about what we are actually doing at, the, at my group at the Astronomical Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences, what, uh, uh, what methods we apply on what uh, part of these systems we focus. And then I will conclude and give some references. So uh, let me introduce my group. So I'm a PI of a, a little bit, uh, a, a small group in uh, the, on the Prague, uh, the Astronomical Institute, which is uh, which consists of two tenure researchers. Petra Sukova is doing pet, uh, basically uh, GRMHD, and she's uh, looking uh, what is going on when we try to cross an accretion disk uh, with a smaller black hole. So you have the supermassive black hole, you have some accretion matter around it, and then you see what happens when a smaller body uh, crosses this, crosses uh, uh, the accreting matter, what kind of outflows is going to uh, go out and what can we, uh, let's say, say about this and uh, what can we detect in electromagnetic spectrum. Then Andre Kopacic is doing mainly uh, black holes and house around black holes using uh, magnetic fields. So the two, three, uh, two, the Two first people are basically uh, our common background is that we are uh, have a good knowledge of chaotic system. So when we started uh, working five years ago, the common glue was uh, uh, dynamical, non uh, non dynamical systems. Then there are two uh, uh, postdocs, junior postdocs. Sajal is uh, learning. Uh, about uh, resonances uh, in non-integrable systems, basically a Birkhoff chains. And we are working on uh, 
the case that the spin, we include the spin of the secondary object. So remember again, I will use the primary and secondary. Primary is the central black hole, secondary is the smaller uh, object orbiting around the primary. And then um, uh, Morteza Karajian is doing uh, canonical perturbation theory. I will talk a little bit later about his work. Then we have uh, four PhD students. Angelica Albertini uh, has joined last year, uh, our group, and she's uh, doing, uh, she will be involved in uh, uh, a, a special model. I will uh, a little bit talk about this is effective one body approximation. I will uh, talk about it in detail later on. And she will try to include uh, the spin in, uh, of the secondary in generic cases. So uh, then Victor Scopi is calculating fluxes. Uh, fluxes is the rate uh, of energy and angular momentum that are lost due to the gravitational uh, reaction. So due to the gravitational waves. Iasun Astimoyanis is a collaborator, a PhD, uh, whose uh, supervisor is uh, Theocharis Apostolatos, but we are working together and we are doing uh, basically theoretical things regarding the spin of the, uh, of the secondary body. And then there is Lukas Polsar, who's doing as Morteza Karekian canonical perturbation theory. So now that I've introduced the group, let me go and uh, talk about the gravitational waves themselves. So uh, the gravitational waves are uh, ripples in the space time. So as you have acoustic waves in uh, a medium, if you imagine that the medium is the space time itself, then the propagation of any perturbation of the space time is done by gravitational waves. Uh, basically in uh, they are caused by a acceleration of a mass distribution but it's a quadruple mass distribution so for example if you have a spherical collapse then you don't have uh, any uh, generation of gravitational waves because you don't have a quadruple uh, deformation in order to deformation a quadruple moment which could produce its acceleration could produce gravitational waves now we have uh, the current, uh, uh, the current uh, terrestrial observatories, gravitational waves of observatories, LIGO and Virgo, are operating in the Hertz regime to kilohertz regime, and uh, they are detecting mainly uh, binaries of uh, similar mass. So you have heard about probably the first, first uh, event that we detected, uh, it's already seven years ago. That was a measure of two uh, plus minus 30 uh, solar masses black holes. And uh, this is basically the band the terrestrial uh, observatory, observatories operate. So, as in the electromagnetic spectrum, in the gravitational, uh, gravitational uh, wave spectrum, we have uh, different bands in which we can uh, detect different things. So in this band uh, that the terrestrial observatories operate, we can only see, only, uh, basically until now we see binary system of co compact objects of, uh, which have basically uh, they are of stellar mass. If you want uh, to go to higher masses, so if you imagine that you increase the mass of the system, then you have to go to, uh, to lower frequencies. So we go from the similar masses of uh, stellar uh, mass, uh, let's say magnitude, to uh, intermediate, uh, intermediate uh, black hole uh, magnitudes that are uh, black holes that have 10, uh, let's say 100 to 10,000 uh, solar masses. And then you go to the millihertz regime where you have uh, total masses that are of, uh, let's say from 
10 to the 5 to 10 to the 9 uh, solar mass systems. Of course, in, uh, in this millihertz, you can have also uh, binary systems, but not at the merger. This is just crossing. They are very far away. They will be uh, orbiting around each other, this stellar, uh, uh, this, uh, stellar mass black holes or neutron stars. They were orbiting for years or months until they pass. Uh, they lose the energy and the momentum. They come close and go to the terrestrial regime. In the very low regime, which is 10 to minus 9 uh, um, uh, hertz, you have the uh, you have the stochastic background, so things that comes from the very early universe. So we have already talked about binaries and we have talked mainly about binaries because this is the main thing that we detect and we hope to detect with the future detectors. Uh, so you, sorry, I forgot to say that we have the SIGO, that is a Japan mission. We have LISA here, which is a European, uh, European Space Agency mission uh, with, uh, uh, with participation of NASA, uh, minor participation and is supposed to fly in uh, 2035, but already we hear about 2037. And so at the end of the, of the let's say around the end of the 30s, 2030s. So in this diagram, you see that for different binaries, we have different treatments. For the similar mass uh, binaries, we have numerical relativity. We take the Einstein field equation and we solve them exactly, uh, uh, not analytically, but uh, with uh, numerical methods. So this is the numerical relativity regime. Small uh, distances between the two objects and uh, the masses are also, the total masses are quite small. Uh, basically, the, the mass ratio is small. The masses are not small because probably we can tackle also supermassive black hole mergers in the future. Then you have far away regime then when you can use the post-Newtonian expansion. So you take the einstein field equation and you say, okay, if I expand them along the velocity of the body, then I can use a Taylor series and I can build up uh, approximately my, uh, my equation of motion. And I can cal calculate also the fluxes, so the energy and the angular momentum loss. And the third regime that we are working is uh, uh, the extreme mass ratio regime when the one body is very small and you have very uh, big primary. And then you can say that basically the small body is moving on the background of the primary body. And then you have this effective one body approximation that is trying to uh, join everything. And I will talk a little bit about it later on. So this is the general scheme, the different methods. And I will analyze a little bit more the perturbation theory and the cell force in, uh, later on in my talk. So, as I said, uh, I have described all already the extreme acceleration spiral. So you have basically the small body, the secondary body, is spiraling into the primary body uh, due to radiation reaction. So we are losing energy angular momentum and the small body is gradually drifting uh, towards the bigger body. You can imagine that, uh, you have heard me probably uh, uh, this, uh, this approximation. So you have uh, some kind of uh, schematic in your head. You can imagine that we have a sheet, we stretch it and we throw a big bowling ball in the middle. So you curve the space time, the sheet is your space time. Then you take a smaller body uh, that is, uh, I don't know, a ball from uh, billiard, uh, billiard, 
and you throw it on the sheet. You start moving on it and it won't uh, deform the sheet too much. The main deformation is from the primary body, but it will create the ripples in the sheet. And these are the gravitational waves. So uh, these gravitational waves are the way that the system is losing energy and, uh, and angular, uh, losing energy angular momentum. And now, a second uh, thing that you can imagine is that you have the old vinyl disc and that you know that you should have the primary, the space time around the primary should be a care. And you know what will be the whole uh, trajectory that you should follow due to the care. And the small body, because it's uh, losing uh, slowly energy on the moment, is scanning very, uh, uh, in a very detailed way, as you have, you have your uh, needle moving on a vinyl disc, is scanning the space time around the primary body. So any sound that will deviate from what we expect, we should be a sign of uh, non careness deviation from GR. So with uh, extreme acceleration spirals, we can probe general relativity and our uh, and uh, the Kerr black hole uh, paradigm. This uh, system, the extreme acceleration spiral system will be detected by ELISA, uh, which I mentioned before, it's the future space uh, based uh, gravitational wave observatory. And in order to be, uh, you have uh, the bottom of the page, you have the schematic and you see the small body orbiting around the primary and a little bit by little inspiring in the primary body. And while it's inspiring, it's emitting uh, gravitational waves. By modeling these gravitational waves, uh, we'll be able to detect uh, the, uh, we will detect the signals that we get from the gravitational waves observatories, which is the current status as well. So what we do, we have some templates, we have pre-modeled everything, and we try to match these templates, these waveforms as you see here, to what we get from the signal. And we're using basic statistics. Basically, we say what of these templates is fitting best the signal that we receive. This is uh, done in the current uh, terrestrial, uh, uh, terrestrial uh, gravitational wave observatories. And you try to get the signal out, out, out of the noise. With LISA, we expect that the problem will be different. We'll have too many signals at the same time. So we'll be detecting uh, uh, binaries, uh, black hole binaries, neutron star binaries, white dwarf binaries, extremas ratios, uh, supermassive black hole binaries at the same time. And we have to have such templates that we can detect the correct thing from a different uh, signals that we receive at the same, uh, at the same moment. This is basically uh, the future terrestrial observatories will probably deal with the same problem. So now we try to dig out the signal from the noise. In the future, we will have too much sig uh, signal. So in the future, uh, around the time that uh, LISA will fly, we'll have also the Einstein telescope, uh, which is a continuation, let's say, of the Virgo, project, the European Virgo project, and the continuation of, uh, continuation of uh, LIGO will be the Cosmic Explorer in United States. And they are planned to be operating at the same time, so at the end, end of 30s. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the laser interference space antenna. So as I said, we anticipate to launch it in 2035. But already uh, you do, there are difficulties and I have heard also dates like 2037. And I must admit that since I joined this mission, 
this the start sets from early 30s and is gradually going to uh, towards the 40s so but the plan is that we will send uh, the three satellites uh, that will uh, leave earth will deploy themselves in a triangular scheme that you see that each uh, arm will have plus minus 2.5 million kilometers length they should be uh their the angular distance between them should be 60 degrees so we have a uh, equilateral uh, tri uh triangle and this sensitivity is very uh, important we cannot depart from one degree so uh this these are very uh, this uh this is a very uh sensitive mission it's a groundbreaking mission because we'll test many things. Even if Lisa Pathfinder that was launched uh, basically uh, seven years ago, we have tested some technologies. Uh, there are some technologies left that have not been tested and they will be tested on fly. So uh, why we have to be uh, so sensitive because if uh, the lasers depart from that, we will lose them, we will lose the spacecraft. So we have basically three spacecraft that are following two test masses that are inside them. So you have two freely falling uh, masses that are each of them is, uh, I think, one kilo of gold. And the whole spacecraft is trying to follow these two test masses. And each spacecraft has uh, two laser beams. So from one spacecraft, you send one laser beam to one other, uh, to one spacecraft, the other uh, laser beam goes to the other spacecraft and each of the spacecraft is sending also laser beams and receiving laser beams. So this is the setup. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about, a little bit about modeling estimation ratio spirals. Uh, the very simplistic idea is the following. You have a secondary that is not spinning. So it's following, basically we switch all the radiation reactions following geodesics. Uh, the space time background is care. We don't have anything uh, perturbing the system. We don't have other uh, bodies orbiting around it or surrounding matter distributions. And uh, we lose energy angular momentum very slowly. And this is, this is by that we mean the adiabatic. This is the meaning of the adiabatic. So this is what leads to the following, uh, uh, let's say uh, the following uh, picture that I described that we have something that goes slowly from a geodesic to a geodesic, scanning carefully the space times and being able to tell us any deviation from that space time. Any, uh, one more uh, thing that is interesting for a dynamical uh, point of view is that there is a fourth uh, uh, constant of motion. So we have uh, stationarity that gives us energy we have uh, uh, axisymmetry that gives us uh, the conservation of the angular momentum along the symmetry axis. We have uh, the Hamiltonian, if you uh, uh, imagine like this, is independent of the evolution in when we don't have gravitational, uh, gravitational reaction, we don't have dissipation. So, uh, there is also a fourth constant. So we have four degrees of freedom, a fourth constant. So the background, the conservative background, uh, by meaning conservative, where there is no dissipation uh, uh, and no deformation from the secondary body, then this is an integrable system. Any deviation that we see from uh, uh, any perturbation that we introduce to the system will be potentially a way to break uh, the, this integrability. So uh, there are uh, some main concepts. There is a two time scale approximation. The basic idea 
that you have the fast movement. This is the movement of the secondary itself, its orbit. And then you have the drift, the slow drift in uh, the constants of motion. And this is the second movement. So you have two time scales. The slow time scale is basically on the action level. So the actions of the, your system are, uh, are changing slowly, are dissipating. And then you have the fast that are angles. So uh, 15 years ago, Hinder and Flanagan found uh, that action angle variables are a very natural way to treat extreme alteration spirals. Then we have the gravitational reaction. So how we calculate the gravitational reaction? Uh, we, because the secondary mass is very uh, small, we can imagine that that troops a little bit the background of the primary. And uh, you can uh, use something like Taylor series and expand uh, your actual metric, that is the metric of your primary plus the secondary uh, combined and the gravitational waves inside all the perturbation. This is the gym you knew tilted. And then you say, okay, this is very difficult to treat. It's basically then we can, uh, if we knew it, we will, so, we will solve it numerically, but this is impossible or very difficult at the moment, at least. Then you try to expand it in the mass ratio. This mass ratio is like a perturbation parameter here. And you take it and you say the gym you knew here without the tilde is of the care or the space time of the primary. And then you start having the perturbation of your space time. Basically, for the, for the extreme alteration spiral that we expect to detect by ELISA, the accuracy is that we have to have all the terms of the first perturbation and some terms from the second perturbation. And there is a very nice uh, review that explains how from this thing, from this very basic concept, we can get the cell force, we can calculate uh, the energy laws, the angular, uh, the, uh, all the fluxes. When I say fluxes, the, this, this energy and angular momentum losses. So this is the gravitational cell force, and this is the driving force for the dissipation of our system. And uh, this is, there is also a conservative part. And recently they have found that probably this conservative part of this term, so you can split it in, in dissipative and the conservative part, and the conservative part is probably breaking the background integrability of the Kerr geodesic uh, system. So uh, another way to calculate fluxes is to use the Tarkovsky equations. So you uh, use a field and you use uh, this field to perturb the Kerr uh, black hole background. So here you put the source. So you can imagine the monopole plus, I will uh, show you later on, you can also include the dipole, which means the spin of the secondary. And then you have a second order partial differential operator that is perturbing this C, uh, and you have to solve this equation with respect to this tau. The sigma is just a, a function of the Kerr uh, space time. And you solve this equation, and from this equation, you can get the gravitational perturbation. And the G, this, uh, this color field is giving you, you can uh, uh, find from this color field the fluxes that you receive an infinity. And you actually can infer what uh, fluxes will be, will be reaching the horizon of the primary black hole. So the Tarkovsky equation are part of this first term of this thing. They are the average uh, dissipative fluxes. So by using the Tarkovsky equation, you can find the average dissipative fluxes, and they are the main drivers 
of the dissipation. So if we have this, we have basically the main driving force, which is making our system to spiral. So this is what we also do in our group, and I will talk a little bit about this later on, about the Tekoski equation and their solutions. And then you have this effective one body approximation that uh, Tripe uh, is using the body center of a binary system in order to map uh, a two body system into a particle moving in effective metric. So what they do, they take the epicenter, they take the care uh, metric and their pet rubit, and they use some free parameters in order to be able to get information from the gravitational surf force, from the extreme mass ratio, uh, from the extreme mass ratio hand, from the numerical relativity when you have similar masses. So this, uh, this method is trying to join everything, having three parameters to be able to uh, get information, basically to balance itself in order to have the correct uh, limits in uh, different, uh, in the, basically I will go back, sorry for that. So this diagram is feeding from everything, from post-Newtonian theory, from perturbation theory, from numerical relativity, joins everything. So we have the most complete model that we can have and use basically just one model to describe them all. This is the main idea. Uh, we have worked in the past actually with uh, Manthos and uh, Panos on this uh, effective one body Hamiltonian and we have produced in 2016 one paper. And uh, currently we are trying uh, with my group to tackle the system again and to go to intermediate mass ratio spirals. So uh, I will talk a little bit about gravitational waves, uh, how they are split uh, their phases. So you have again this figure and you can see that you have some, uh, uh, some oscillations, some oscillations and uh, these oscillations are, are following some phase, let's say. If you have a semi quasi circular spiral, then the, this, the phase of the gravitational wave is twice the phase of the orbit. So if we have just a phi here, so the phase of the, of the gravitational wave will be twice the phase of this. So we can split it in different uh, parts. This is the adiabatic part. This is, as I told you, the average dissipative fluxes. This is driving uh, the, uh, the system. Then you have something that I will discuss later on. And then you have the post-adiabatic. These are smaller corrections. So if you have uh, a mass ratio 10 to minus four, then this is 10 to the fourth radians. And this is just one radian. And this part is a puzzling part. This, uh, this is what, uh, if you introduce, for example, non-integrability into the system, uh, will break the, the resonant tori and create a Birkhoff chain. And then you have something that, if this is a perturbation that will grow, this resonant uh, island will grow, or general resonance will grow like square root of the, of the perturbation. And the phase is the square root, is analog to the square root of the perturbation divided by the mass ratio. So uh, if you have a very strong perturbation, then uh, this can go towards the adiabatic, so become very important for the system. Or if it's a small perturbation, we'll discuss also these things, we can go to the post-adiabatic uh, corrections which uh, contain the conservative part of the cell force, uh, the oscillating part, uh, the spative part of the first order cell force, the average second order uh, dissipative cell force. So this is 
however, of the order of radial. And there is also the contribution from the spin of the secondary. So if we uh, uh, take into account the spin of the secondary, this is just correction of a post-adiabatic post order. Uh, this is just of the order of radians. So now that I have described the basic things, let me go into some uh, things that we work on in our group. And I will start uh, with some orbital dynamics where we use chemical perturbation theory. Then the fluxes are basically the, the solution of the Tarkovsky equations. And then uh, something more familiar to the audience of the uh, RC, uh, of the research center of applied uh, mathematics and astronomy, which is the resonances. Uh, so maybe I don't have to introduce, but I don't know who's in the audience, so I will do this anyhow. So the motivation is if we have a, a per troop system, uh, uh, imagine that this now uh, integrable system, we, and we want to uh, get in action angle variables, then we can use the least series in order to make a series of canonical perturbation that will lead us to an approximative Hamiltonian that will be in action angle variables, so, uh, sorry, in actions. So we will have pushed away all the angular uh, part. So you, have, you can see the Birkhoff normal form down here. So we have used a series of canonical transformation. We have pushed all the angle uh, uh, dependence to the remainder. And now we have an approximative uh, Hamiltonian just in actions. And this is very powerful since uh, if you imagine that we have to evolve these uh, things for several cycles, the extrema ratio in spirals, you don't, know, you don't want to have something like elliptic uh, integrals or complicated equation of motion. You need some closed forms. Closed forms are very fast. They are just very basic functions and you can evolve all your system very fast. So one of the problems that we have with extremes ratio in spirals now is that, that in order to calculate one spiral, we need uh, usually something like hours in the best cases. And we have to go to milliseconds. You have to be able to detect uh, everything in uh, the millisecond regions. So we have to push to have very uh, good approximation of these systems. And uh, having something close for is a very good uh, way because it's, uh, uh, for uh, computational reasons, these uh, things are computed very fast, additions and uh, differences, multiplication, etc. So another thing is uh, the interesting about the canonical is that we have, uh, the system, since it's canonical, the transformation is invertible. So we can go from the old variables to the new variables and back and forth and do all the combinations that we need. And the other interesting thing is that since we have uh, several, uh, we, we have several reasons, physical reasons, that will make the system non-integrable. It's nice that the canonical perturbation theory can uh, uh, approximate the non-integrable system by an integrable one. So a natural first step is to see what happens with the Kerr space-time. So if you see here is uh, the, uh, uh, one of the postdocs, uh, one a PhD, Christos is helping this, and uh, me is also uh, uh, participating in this effort. So the idea was the following. If you have Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild, the movement on the Schwarzschild, geodetic movement is basically happening on a, on a plane. The, you don't have any uh, oscillations of this orbital plane. When you introduce the care parameter, so the spin of the primary, this uh, plane starts to oscillate. So with a special way, we can separate the Hamiltonian of the care black hole into a radial part and an angular part. 
So the natural way is to start from Schwarzschild and to perturb, uh, use the care parameter as a perturbation in order to create small oscillation around the uh, initial inclination of your uh, uh, orbital plane. And then you can use uh, uh, for the uh, radial part that you see that is now just functions of, uh, of, the, rad of the, uh, the radius. We can use spherical orbits in order to make a second perturbation. So we split the initial coming order into parts. The angular part, where you apply the canonical perturbation theory uh, by doing perturbation along the initial inclination of your uh, Schwarzschild plane. And then you take some, uh, some uh, spherical orbit and you do the usual thing that you start from the uh, 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 small uh, from the uh, oscillator, you introduce more terms and you little by little you build up your thing in order to go to higher and higher statistics. You see that uh, also since the angular momentum is perpendicular always to the, uh, to the orbital plane, we see these small oscillations. So if we, uh, we applied this method, uh, and uh, since the mass ratios that we expect for the extreme mass ratios are from 10 to minus four to 10 to minus seven, and the cycles that we need, that we estimate that we'll need, uh, or that we'll detect during the spiral of uh, extreme mass ratio spiral using LISA are inversely to the mass ratio. So if we have something like 10 to minus four, we have 10 to four cycles from beginning to the end, or we have 10 to minus five, it's 10 to the five cycles from the beginning to the end. So if we take the angular part and we have accuracy that's below 10 to minus nine, so the angle uh, uh, we have uh, error of 10 to minus five, nine, and we have 10 to seven cycles, then the error is very is below the accuracy of your uh, uh, the error that introduces below the accuracy of your detector, which is of the order of radians. So, if we go, however, to the radial part where we have started from the smallest eccentricities, this is fine, ten to minus nine, but ten to minus four is a bad approximation. So, when you Go over 10 to the four cycles, you have error of one radian. And this is already uh, what you should be able to measure. So we, the, with this scheme that we used, we can uh, tackle only cases of low eccentricity. Uh, we have to change the, our approximation in order to tackle higher eccentricities in care. Now, Let's go to something more fancy. We take a Schwarzschild black hole, and then we go and put a ring around it. And we actually uh, approximate this ring just by its quadruple multiple. So we expand the, uh, the ring in multiple moments, and we just cut the first one. Why we want, want to do that? Because we want to have a more generic uh, deformation of uh, the initial space time. So you see now the ring, but this is not actually the, what we do. We use a quadruple, just the first the quadruple term of this ring, up to the quadruple term of the multiple expansion of this ring. And then instead of the uh, just uh, staying on the orbital plane, one orbital plane, this is starting to oscillate and precess because of the existence of the, of the ring. The ring is also breaking the integrability. So in this recent uh, work with uh, Polzar and Vizzani, we have uh, tackled this non-integrable problem. And we were, the superposition that you see here is basically the black hole plus the ring. And we were able to find gravitational waves 
what will be the gravitational waves from such a system using uh, a very fast uh, approximation uh, due to the canonical perturbation uh, uh, theory. We were able to put everything in actions and evolve just the actions. So instead of uh, solving uh, uh, angles, uh, different uh, parts of the Hamiltonian, uh, we were able to reduce this in a very uh, simple first order uh, differential uh, equation uh, system with one constraint and then everything was solved. And this was quite fast and we were able to get this uh, flux, uh, this uh, strain. So I, will, I didn't say what strain, this is sorry for that. So uh, the strain is the perturbation, the, uh, the relative uh, difference in uh, if a gravitational wave pass between two bodies is the shift that uh, uh, towards the distance be uh, between these two bodies that is basically the strain. But if we want to measure the strain in, uh, uh, by a gravitational wave observatory, we see how the two test bodies will be shifted uh, with respect to the distance between them. So this is a strain that we plotted here, and this is the gravitational wave. Uh, so this is uh, with respect to the canonical perturbation theory, and then I will go to the Tarkovsky equation. Then what we do in the group, we don't use just a non-spinning body. We introduce the spin. The spin is uh, represented by a spin tensor. V is a velocity. And using this uh, stress energy tensor in the Tarkovsky equation, we are able to get the fluxes from a such system. So there are two approximations in order to do that. The time domain, this is basically taking a time series uh, and uh, using the Tarkovsky equation numerically to solve uh, the input of this time uh, in, the, so in the time series. So what you fit from the time series is you give the uh, momentum, the velocities, the spin tensor, et cetera. And since the uh, source term is changing, you uh, get uh, the solution because of the change of the source. This method, however, is slow. It's very slow and not very accurate at the moment. We have, however, an existing uh, well-tested code that is able to test uh, to, to give us all the fluxes that we need. On the other hand, there is a frequency domain that is based on that, that if you have bound orbits, you can always get the frequencies. And the, from the frequencies, you can, let's say it like this, you can get the Fourier uh, transformation. You can get uh, the, uh, the source uh, in uh, to expand in the Fourier series. And from that, we can get very fast uh, and accurate results fast with relative to the time domain and accurate again with uh, respect to the time domain. And recently we have for the spinning body, we have for the first time uh, something written in the frequency domain. So now with uh, Victor Scopi, we are trying to uh, generate uh, uh, fluxes for generic orbits and the code is under development. So uh, now something that you are more familiar with, as I said, you will introduce a perturbation to the system, will probably break the background degradability. So when I say background degradability, is basically if you imagine the Hamiltonian of a Kerr geodesic. And the most important thing, uh, one of the important thing is to know uh, how the, this uh, perturbation is, uh, 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 how the perturbation is uh, is relevant to the grow to the width of the of the resonances, because if you remember, there was a square root of epsilon over the mass ratio, 
and this can tell us how important are the phases, uh, the importance of the phases due to the uh, introduction of the non-integrability. So you can see that of, due to the spin-induced uh, uh, resonances, when I say spin-induced, I mean the spin of the secondary, then we have some the epsilon that is proportional to S square and pro, uh, the, spin of, the spin of the body is proportional to the Q square. So if we go to the phase, this is order one. So this is an order of radians. If we go to something like uh, a deformation of the Kerr black hole, like the Manko Novico case that we have studied uh, 15 years ago with uh, Professor Kodopoulos, in this case, we studied another uh, similar uh, space time. Then the epsilon is of the order of the quadrupole deformation of the central black hole. So if you don't have uh, the multiple expansion of the Kerr black hole, but you change the quadrupole term of the, uh, of the central black hole in the framework of the general relativity, you have a non-degradable system, and then you have instead of a uh, resonance story, you have a Birkhoff chain, and this will be uh, the resonance will have beef, and uh, we will have to tackle with uh, going through uh, non-zero measure uh, tori. So uh, with uh, Panos and Mathos, uh, what we try to do is repeat these results that we have from the spin-induced resonances, but instead of Schwarzschild, like we did it in this work, to do it for Kerr. And this will be more uh, difficult because in Schwarzschild, we have more uh, integrals that we were, and we were able to reduce the system to two degrees of freedom. So we ha can have uh, the usual Poincare section, but uh, the case of the Kerr has less integrals. So we have to tackle uh, with the systems that we can reduce to just three degrees of freedom. And uh, this uh, is a more, we need the 4D Poincare section. So it's something that we are currently working on with Panos and Anthos. Now, what is the effect of this, uh, the crossing of these resonances? If you imagine that there's a rotation number, then this is a crossing of quasi-periodic, basically, uh, orbits. Then you go to the resonance, you create this plateau, and then you exit the resonance, and you, again, is basically the, the rotation uh, curve that you know with some uh, little bit funny things. This is because this, is used, uh, this was computed from a freak uh, using a Fourier analysis. So some naturas is created instead of plateau of these oscillations. If you go and uh, try to see how this will be seen on the periodogram, so if you have seen uh, some uh, uh, detection of gravitational waves, you will see such peri periodograms. So this is uh, each of oh, these are uh, time slices, and each time slice is giving you the Fourier analysis. And you see how a crossing of the resonance would be seen on such a periodogram. This is a work by uh, uh, Tiriakos de Stunis uh, and Costas Kokotas. And uh, recently, we have uh, tried to tackle the system using a Kerr analog. So uh, gravitational cell force is very difficult, but there is electromagnetic cell force. And we said, OK, let's put a charged particle in around a black hole that's immersed in a test magnetic field, a homogeneous test field. This will break the integrability. We'll have the resonances. We'll try to cross them. And we'll try to see how the exact cell force can be correlated to the adiabatic uh, uh, calculation. So the adiabatic calculations, uh, I would like you to remember, are just an average dissipative uh, uh, flux of, of, uh, of a cell force. 
Here we use a, uh, the full cell force, the black dots, against the blue uh, points that are the uh, approximation, the adiabatic approximation that we use. And this uh, was a basic step in order to see if we use something more fast than the cell force, this is the adiabatic, if our uh, calculation will be still correct. And as you see, they are not quantitatively totally correct, but qualitatively one can be satisfied. Uh, now you see some vertical blue lines that this, in the cases, so you have some initial uh, conditions outside the resonance, and you have the time that it, the, the spiral stay in the resonance. And if you have these two blue vertical lines or the two black lines on the right plot, uh, the one is the left plot is one to three resonance, uh, the right plot is uh, one to two resonance. Then you can see that uh, in some cases, the spiral enters the resonance and cannot leave, at least for the computation time that we evolve it. So this is very interesting. We initially thought that it was an artifact of the adiabatic approximation, but it seems that it's not that uh, the exact cell force, at least the electromagnetic cell force, I stress again, this is an uh, analog of extreme ratio spiral. We don't use gravitational cell force. We use the simpler electromagnetic cell force can create uh, similar effects. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you. So I would like to summarize by some takeaway points. So. MRIs are probing, uh, will probe the, the space time uh, around supermassive black holes to unprecedented precision. And we'll be able to test also general relativity to high accuracy. Uh, most of the methods that you saw uh, that I presented are coming from perturbation theory. So this is a field that uh, the research center is familiar with. In my group, we focus on resonance crossing, on uh, Tarkovsky equation, equation, uh, Tarkovsky equation solvers, and uh, recently we start using canonical perturbation theory in order to simplify our equation of motion. So I will just show you some references and thank you for uh, your attention. Well, Yoro, thank you very much for this very analytic presentation. Of course, we have time for questions. Uh, before asking if someone wants to ask something, uh, uh, let me uh, see if I have- Can a, you speak uh, up? Because, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know the problem. So the, uh, what uh, I want to ask you, so to understand if I have the right picture, when we have the inspiraling body, this takes many dynamical times until it comes closer and closer to the main, uh, the, the mass, yeah. right? How many, I mean, uh, how many dynamical so, times? Uh, so it's almost so, circular. It's so, uh, so if you, if one cycle is just, uh, when I was talking about cycles, is one, uh, let's say, from periastron to periastron. Yes, exactly, okay. So, no, so this, as I said, it depends on the mass ratio. So okay. uh, it's inverse of the mass ratio. So uh, mm -hmm. the extreme mass ratio spiral starts from the 10 to minus four and go up to 10 to minus uh, seven. Okay. So for uh, if you inverse it, you have 10 to four cycles or 10 to the seven cycles. It depends on the mass ratio of the system. Okay. The, uh, the resonance crossing is how big is the resonance? Mm -hmm. And uh, depends also is very sensitive to the initial phase. So how you will enter this resonance? Okay. 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 So practically and, uh, we have to do with the circular yeah. orbits, right? Uh, as it goes. It's chaotic system. So, yeah. 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 But we hope that you can average, if you saw this, basically uh, there are some average times that you can say, for example, that the one to three resonance lasted of about 15,000 uh, amps. Or uh, so maybe we can simplify the system, but we have to see. We have to see. This is uh, something that we are uh, looking into. Okay. 
we, we have a small technical problem. This yeah. uh, so I have a five year long project. <laughs> I have a nice nice geometric picture there where we have anyway. Let me see if there is someone else who wants to ask something. There are no other questions from the audience here. And what about people that follow? No, I don't see anything else. So then let's see when, uh, in a few days we have uh, you with us and then we can discuss everything in more details uh, in person. Okay. okay. So in that case, we ask, we thank Georgos again. Okay, thank you very much. See you next week.